as we start, the, the title for today's talk is Edgar Cayce's Greatest Hits. And the, um, the idea behind it is, is my take on what I think uh, have influenced me the most from Edgar Cayce's readings and what I think are some of the uh, influential aspects of Cayce's work. But as this is coming up, I'd like each of you to take a moment and just think about what of Edgar Cayce's work has influenced you the most? What do you think is the most uh, important aspect of uh, Mr. Cayce's work? I know it's, it's a long, long list. So just take a moment to, uh, to do that as they're doing, getting the PowerPoint ready. Or we can take a moment of silence, whichever you prefer. Good, there we are. No, not yet. Not yet. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and so um, you heard I'll be at Hopkinsville next year. I'm excited about that. If you haven't been, it's kind of, I think for an ARE Caseyite, it's like going to Mecca. I think everyone should make one pilgrimage, at least in their life to Hopkinsville to see the, the source, to see where Edgar Casey came from. And uh, I hadn't gone as long as I had been involved with the work. I didn't go until last year. And uh, it was very moving. It was just to see uh, where he grew up and to, of course to see the family, his grave, and to see uh, Gertrude's grave, the whole family. That was quite uh, impressive. So I hope some of you can join, uh, join us next year at uh, Hopkinsville. Good, so you've, you've thought of some of the uh, aspects of Casey's work that's been influential to you. Why don't we start, let's collect ourselves into this space and let's just take a, uh, a moment of silence. And you might want to take a moment uh, to silence your cell phone too. Thank you. All right, so let's start spinning some of Edgar Cayce's greatest hits. I thought, just to com out of comparison with uh, Mr. Cayce's work, I thought we'd get some, to show the height of Edgar Cayce's work, I thought we might start with some of mine, some of my greatest misses. It's through the Cayce work that I've become a past life regressionist. And these are some examples from my recent work. Someone came to me uh, a couple of weeks ago. She was having one of these, for me, is a rare future life progression. She was seeing a future life, seeing the world in the future. And in deep trance, in a hushed tone, she said, the, the, the Marines are rebuilding the world. And so, you know, I, in my mental Google, I saw the Marines, they're, they have, they're rebuilding the world. Isn't that interesting that we don't think of the military necessarily? And she said, no, Peter, the Lemurians are rebuilding the world. So I'm very glad I got that clarified. That would have been quite a typo if I put that in my book. But it doesn't stop there. A few days later, a woman's just crossing behind the veil. She's opening the door, and she says, squirrels, squirrels, so many squirrels. And I say, squirrels? She goes, no, scrolls, scrolls, so many scrolls. So just to, I have a GoFundMe. I'm asking, it's not an ex, I'm asking for the not expensive hearing aid. This is the state of the art in Edgar Casey's time. Oh. Good, so Mr. Casey had a lot more accuracy than I did. So just to start with Edgar Cayce's work, I think foundational is that I think we've all experienced that there is in this work that which can change the thought of humankind. And if mind is indeed the builder, 
let's look at how our thoughts have been influenced, how our thinking has been influenced by the work of Edgar Cayce. Now, greatest hits, you know, bear with me, just this, these ideas. Of course, I think you can't talk about Edgar Cayce without talking about ideals. I think that's foundational in Cayce's work, and it, it, it interweaves with all the lectures you have here. I'm not going to, this isn't going to be an ideals workshop, but just, just to show you some of the depth of the influence of ideals, as you know, Edgar Cayce had a past life as John Bainbridge. You know, if you think of the past lives of Edgar Cayce, he had this high life as Rata, high spiritual life as the priest Rata. Very spiritually attuned, uh, could probably give readings in the waking state, you know, uh, helping others. And so he reincarnates in one lifetime as James Bainbridge, in one lifetime as Edgar Cayce. Jane, uh, I'm sorry, John Bainbridge becomes the riverboat gambler. He has all this psychic ability. He uses his psychic ability to, uh, to win at cards and to seduce women like crazy. And, that was, and then he reincarnates as Edgar Cayce and he uses his psychic ability in a much, much different way. What's the difference? What was the difference between Bainbridge and Cayce? Obviously ideals. Edgar Cayce had the ideal of service and John Bainbridge had the ideal of self-service, kind of working towards self. And I think it's interesting that you look at Casey's work in trying to make amends for Bainbridge. You know, what did he do? Here, as a uh, riverboat gambler, he ripped off mostly men, you know, probably all men, through gambling. You know, he could see their cards. He knew when to hold them and when to fold them. And so what does he do as Edgar Casey? He helps lots of men make money because he had taken their money, he, he saw that they got it back. And then he had injured lots of women emotionally, who knows what other ways. And so that's what he did as Edgar Casey. He helped women, perhaps the injuries they suffered there emotionally were playing out physically. And so it's interesting that he had to revisit this life. And I, because I think sometimes we wonder why Edgar Casey was so selfless in helping you know, so many of the people in New York, especially the men, to make money without much of that coming back. So I think this helps understand a little bit of the connection there. And I also think that <clears throat> what I've taken from this is that oftentimes a great healer has had a past life where they've been less than that and they're meeting the karma. So Edgar Cayce helping so many people, in some ways he was meeting the karma of those he had injured. And you can think of, you know, let's say if we talk even about Jesus, Casey said that Jesus had previous lives, and as Joshua, in one of his previous lives, he had killed people. And so as Jesus, he is healing, even resurrecting the dead in the same places where in that past life he had killed. So you see how there's that, we come back. And so that's helped me have compassion for, you know, if you see in current time, if you see the scoundrels of our current time, they may be the great healers in the future as spirit progresses to evolve within them. And then this interesting reading. It was two sisters. This is, uh, uh, Sydney has alerted me to this reading. Two sisters that in a past life had been prostitutes. And one of them gained and one of them lost. You know, that's Casey's language for your soul development in a lifetime. How could that be? How could Obviously, it's because of the motivation. One of them served as a companion to lonely men, and that's the one who gained. I don't know what the, what the motivation of the other one was. It, might have, it was, uh, was different, but it's, it's what's in the heart. You know, the ideal is the, what motivates you. It's, not, it's, it's how you do something, it's not what you do. And then we know the Blumenthal's were stockbrokers, and they were wondering, you know, Money is money dirty, you know. Should we, should we uh, change careers to, uh, to be more fully with our ideal? In case he said no, that Jesus himself could have been a stockbroker. That's what he would might have looked like. You know, he, had, <laughs> <coughs> he had he had light colored eyes, so he would need sunglasses. But you know, he, he could have stayed true to all of his ideals, and been still been the Christ. Now let me tell you kind of one of the foundational stories that I've heard here 
at the ARE. Some of you have heard this. Um, I first heard it from Mark Thurston, and he talked about that when he was uh, on staff, when he was one of the directors here, that uh, a group, a, a fundamentalist religious group, approached the ARE about making a documentary film. And in this film, they wanted to portray different spiritual and religious traditions and, uh, oops, let me, one of my buttons, when I did the microphone. Okay. Um, this, uh, this group was wanting to make this documentary film and Charles Thomas Casey was the, uh, the director at the time, so he invited a dialogue with this group about this documentary that they were interested in making. Now, Charles Thomas knew, as did the other staff members, that this group had historically been very, very critical of the ARE. So they were a little bit like, it might be Greeks bearing gifts. So the, the dialogue was going on, but the sticking point was over the final say. This group wanted to have final say over how the ARE was going to be put, presented in this documentary, and Charles Thomas and the ARE didn't want to allow that. They wanted to have final say because, you know, they could come and, and film and then they might skew what they got towards their perspective. Now, at this final meeting where it became clear that um, there was not gonna, the ARE was not going to relent on this point and <coughs> was not going to participate in the uh, film, the group sort of uh, showed their cards. They kind of let down their hair. And what they said is, do you know why we don't like you people? <laughs> And you know, when, when, when a sentence ends in you people, you know, you know you're put up your walls. And, and Mark talks about how he was interested. You know, he said, we know why, we know that they don't like us, but it'll finally be revealed. The, the, you know, the hatred revealed. Is it because of, you know, reincarnation? You know, is it because we deviate from uh, Christian doctrine? Or is it because we're soft on sin? What, what is the reason that they, <laughs> they, they hate us? And this gentleman said, do you know why we dislike you people? Because you dare to teach that anyone has access to God. Ooh. How dare you teach that? <laughs> and, you know, think about that. If you want to dislike Edgar Cayce, if you want to dislike the ARE, that's a good reason. That's a good reason to dislike the, the organization. And I believe that, that that's the foundation of what Edgar Cayce created with the New Age movement. I think, in a way, that's why we're all here, and I think that's why the New Age movement has spread throughout the world. Because I think, as souls, we've got tired of the franchising of God. That you have to be a, you know, a card-holding member of some religion, and that's the only one that's going to get to heaven, and that God has some kind of criteria over who He loves and who He doesn't, and, and that somehow that uh, has an influence. And that's what that group meant, you know, but that group isn't alone. There's other traditions that think that they're the only ones that reach that. And I think that as a soul group, as a people, we're tired of that. We are here because we know that God is the God of all people. We all have access to God. And when Casey was asked, because Edgar Casey in the waking state was a devout Christian, <clears throat> and he heard in the readings about Lao Tzu and Confucius and Buddha and Muhammad, began to question, he, he began to question his own faith, his, his, uh, his beliefs. And so he asked, what's the best religion? And that's the answer, the one that you'll practice, the one that you'll actually practice. You know, are you, will you be a good Christian? Will you be a good Muslim? Will you be a good Jew? That's what matters more than uh, anything else. And for me, that's the, that's the foundation of the New Age movement. That's what's spread, that God is the God of all people and that we're, we want to worship God more than we want to worship a religion. I think we've gotten a little bit uh, religion-centered. Now, this reading, many of you know, it's given many time in Casey's work or this statement that there's a pattern in all of us, imprinted in our mind, awaiting to be awakened by our will of our soul's oneness with God. That we all have this pattern of oneness, but it's dormant, it's sleeping, and we have to activate it through our will, which is through our choices. Now, 
If you're a student in a class and this sounds theoretical, you may want an example. What, what does this look like? What would, what would somebody look like if they had activated this oneness pattern? Casey's answer to this would be, Jesus was a pretty good example of this awakened pattern. A very good example. And in a way, Jesus came because we weren't understanding that. And so to understand that, that if you act from the place of oneness, you'll look a lot like Jesus. But it doesn't mean that Jesus is the only way, that there is not the, see that, he calls this the Christ consciousness. But there's nobody's name here. You can awaken this pattern. You know, being raised Christian, it didn't make sense to me that Chinese people that had never heard of Jesus were going to go to hell. How does that make sense? And how is it that the hope of Christianity supposedly comes from China? Is it because all the Chinese people are going to convert to Christianity? Or is it more likely that the Chinese people are going to awaken this pattern in whatever religion they, uh, they espouse to? So I find this foundational. And I like to talk about this so that we move out of the perspective of religion. You know, Casey was clear that Jesus was the man and the Christ is the consciousness. And I think we're all trying to uh, aspire to this oneness consciousness. Now, you have homework. <clears throat> Don't think you're getting off easy. I'm, uh, they're inviting me to, uh, thinking about having me at AU, so I want to start getting comfortable being a professor. So for next year, you know, Casey advised, I think it was six months. He says, Joan, you know, it's in the Search for God material. Don't just look at oneness and think that you understand it. Really ponder it for six months. Oneness, what does oneness mean? Are all of us here one? How does that make sense? We all look so different. You know, uh, Casey said that when Jesus was teaching and they interrupted him and said, your, your mother and your brother are here. And he says, is, is not everyone here, my mother and my brother? He says, that was the oneness consciousness manifesting through Jesus. You know, a little bit like if you think of the person you most love, the avatar, the high spiritual person, loves everyone that way, sees everyone as their, as their family. And isn't it nice, I think Congress, we get invited to feel that with a group. You know, when I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking, this feels to me like I'm at a family reunion. I see you, you know, I visit you out in your home, I've been to many of your homes, I've stayed in many, many of you have woken me up as I've overslept before, before some, <laughs> but it, you feel like family, like we're all coming together for a reunion. So it feels a little strange that I'm up here talking, unless I'd be giving a toast or something. So maybe we're, we're toasting Edgar Casey. That's the way I can think of it. But I think we're, we're experimenting with oneness here. And I think we're challenged and invited to bring the oneness consciousness when we live here, where it might be a little more challenging, might be a little more, uh, the soul group that, that we call our family, those are the ones that, you know, the, the work might be uh, most importantly applied. Now, uh, another um, important aspect of Casey's readings, and these are all, they're all one, they're all connected, uh, holism. Edgar Casey invited us to think holistically. We know him as the father of holistic medicine. The reference in the Journal of the American Medical Association was actually that he was a forerunner of holistic medicine. And holism is merely the, the concept of looking at systems as wholes rather than parts. And so as <clears throat> in holistic medicine, we're encouraged to look at the mind-body connection, the mind-body-spirit connection. In Edgar Cayce's time, if you went to a doctor, they would pretty much focus on your physical body. He broke that paradigm by beginning to look at how your thoughts, are you dwelling on grudges, are you pessimistic, do you want to get better, that this kind of optimism or, or thinking affected your health. That was revolutionary at that time. Now it's more, more and more mainstream. But I think we owe a great debt of gratitude to his bringing that to our consciousness. And I encourage us to begin to think, is the holistic view God's view? You know, is it the, the ego self that sees itself in separate units? And is the overarching view the whole? And 
if we look at it just with the holistic approach to us, ourselves physically, mentally, and spiritually, that's where really health is. And you all know the story of the three blind uh, men <clears throat> that approach the elephant. And the one at the nose says it's like rope. No, the ear, it's like paper. And the leg, no, it's like a tree trunk. And each of them is just touching a part of the whole. And from their perspective, they're right. But the elephant, the holistic view, is that includes all of that. And I think that I'm going to branch, I think, well, here we have his beliefs in holistic medicine, integrating the three. And interestingly, he says that illness really starts at the disconnection between spirit and mind. That that's the beginning. And if I work a lot with addictions, <clears throat> and the addiction model, the Alcoholics Anonymous, the anonymous movement works for anything. You know, there's an AA, a BA, a CA, a Junkaholics Anonymous, you shop, whatever it is that you get addicted to, it's about reconnecting to spirit. And if you look at the literature on people that heal themselves from cancer or any kind of even physical illness, it's not just what they've done with their body. They've usually changed their thinking and they've gotten into some strange practices like prayer and meditation and group work, things that reconnect themselves uh, spiritually. But I also think we don't talk a little bit about Edgar Cayce uh, as a forerunner of holistic theology. And I think that's foundational in what we call the New Age, is that, again, uh, Edgar Cayce's viewpoint is looking at God as the elephant and not the ear, the nose, or the leg, that uh, he's brought into our consciousness these Eastern beliefs of meditation, all of these, but meditation, karma, reincarnation. You know, if, he hadn't, if he hadn't brought in this uh, concept of reincarnation, you know, I'd, I don't know what I'd be doing. And, you know, I work with reincarnation. I guess since I'd be working maybe as an insurance salesman. I'd be with mutual life instead of many life. You know. <laughs> I had, I've had the great privilege of having um, Paul Mazza stay with me this week, and so I get to test my material on Paul, and, and Paul laughs at anything, and so he is the greatest uh, tester of, I shouldn't say laughs at anything, but he's not very, uh, you know, he's very gentle in his, uh, his, his approach, so, so he laughed at that joke, glad you did uh, too. So just think about this, this is kind of what we've grown comfortable with in our Western mindset. And then Edgar Cayce invites us into some of these concepts, which are traditionally from the Eastern, uh, Eastern mindset, Eastern religion, Eastern principles. You know, the, the foundational belief in the West is know thyself. And the foundational belief in the East is Confucianist, which is about the whole is greater than the uh, individual. And so Casey becomes this bridge, you know, and after Edgar Casey gave his readings, you know, the gurus from India started coming into the United States and started teaching us about meditation. And we started uh, working with understanding karma and, you know, these, these concepts. He kind of, I believe he was one of those who opened the door to this uh, holistic view of God. You know, you may uh, consider yourself uh, a Christian but also believe in reincarnation. Edgar Cayce had a hard time with that because he's one of the first people that had to wrestle with being Christian and branching into non-Christian beliefs. You know, he, he made two promises. If he ever gave a reading that hurt somebody, he would stop giving readings. And if he ever gave a reading that went against his foundational Christian beliefs, he would stop giving readings. And when reincarnation came up, he didn't know what to do with it. It took him a while to, uh, uh, to, to include that in his belief. And I think that um, later on I'll go more in depth about Jesus, but I'll just segue into that now. Uh, Casey's story of Jesus is much different more than what I grew up with thinking about Jesus. You know, he talks about those lost years of Jesus and really makes Jesus into uh, a unifier, that he was really working with the Christ consciousness. He was working with God, not a religion. And so he, had, he went to India and Persia and Egypt and brought in those spiritual traditions into what we have come to, uh, to call Christianity. Now, interestingly, what's got kind of weeded out of what he, uh, Jesus taught 
were meditation and reincarnation. That got kind of receded. And I think that Edgar Cayce, as part of the Christ consciousness movement in the earth, brought that forward. That needed to, we needed to be reminded of meditation and reincarnation. When Casey was asked, though, did Jesus know how to meditate? He said, yes, of course. He had been in India. He was a, uh, would be considered a, a sage or a, a yogi. And they said it, he said the reference is made in the Bible quote where this is the, the back story Casey fills us in on is that apparently uh, Jesus would not tire, needed less sleep. He was continually moving and oftentimes his, uh, his apostles would say, you know, Jesus, we gotta, we're hungry, we need to, to sleep. And he said, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's uh, set up camp, let's uh, do that. And then they asked him, how come you eat less than us? How come you're, uh, you just seem to have this boundless energy? And his answer, and this is, what's, is in the Bible, I eat of the meat of which you know not of. And that was just his ability to uh, work with um, etheric or spiritual energies to nurture himself, which we would now call uh, advanced meditation uh, techniques. So apparently he, he taught that. And then Edgar Cayce wrestled with, uh, the, you know, he was always reading the Bible. And so when um, Jesus says, behold, Elijah, and the, the apostles say they knew he was talking about John, it's a possibility that John is the reincarnation of Elijah. And there's some mentions of uh, potentials for reincarnation in uh, Jesus' story. And the, the, as Christians, we're, we're more comfortable with resurrection. And it's possible that that's a, a translation of the word, resurrection and, and reincarnation. Now, what Casey brings to this, you know, the, the ego mind likes to think of things as either or. You know, it's either know thyself or lose thyself. And Casey says both. Know yourself to be yourself and yet be one with God or creative forces. He said, I got involved with meditation when I was uh, 17. I did the transcendental meditation uh, practice. Um, my father was always into something. I think of my dad as more of a seeker than a finder. You know, one week it was uh, Tai Chi, then it was meditation, then it was Silva mind control. He could have written a book about, you know, the the 1970s uh, spiritual self-help movement. Now, I was 17, and so he wanted all of us, he had learned TM, and he had really enjoyed it, and he put us all into a course, and it was a week-long course, and uh, you know, I'm sitting in the class, I'm thinking, okay, I'm 17, I got one more year of my dad making choices for me, and so I'm sitting in this, let's see what he's got in mind this time, and I really liked the class. I really uh, took to meditation. And I remember for the five years after that, I followed the TM practice. I did the 20 minutes twice a day and uh, really was a, uh, uh, and to this day, meditation is a, a foundational practice um, for me. But uh, when you get it deeper into meditation, you start going to places that are <coughs> called ashrams. Anyone here been to an ashram? Yeah, good, you survived here, <laughs> ashram stay. Well, ashrams, are the, it comes from uh, the Indian tradition, and you, you go to a place and they, they create the space, you know, it's usually vegetarian, I think they're probably all vegetarian, and you, uh, you have the space to focus on your inner work, your meditation practice, and, and then you have your meals together, oftentimes in silence. I went to one that we were discouraged even from making eye contact uh, with one another, really about turning inward. But when you go to ashrams, you're oftentimes uh, greeted by someone, sometimes a woman, she's in flowing gowns, um, her name is something like, I'm Shatrina, and she doesn't look like she's eating enough, and she talks like, welcome, welcome to our ashram, and let me show you around, this is where we sleep, and this is where we, we eat, but I don't eat, you know, you're, you're, she's showing you around, and, and my feeling was always like, you know, I'm going to be here for two weeks, Am I going to leave in two weeks? I'm ah, I'm Peterino. <laughs> Welcome to the ashram. You know, I, I didn't like that idea of of just being, you know, losing myself, my whole ego into this I don't know what this abyss of oneness uh, uh, idea. And what Casey says here is that you don't have to do that. 
you can lose yourself into the hole, but maintain your wacky, goofy personality. I, was, I, I wanted to do that. And it said Jesus was the example of that. It said if, if we had known Jesus, we would have loved hanging out with him. That Jesus had a great sense of humor. He played music. He'd have a drink every now and then. He was a, a people person. But he also was one with the Creator. You know, I think that in my spiritual development, I still enjoy uh, humor, but, I, but, but what I laugh at has evolved, and kind of what, you know, what I make jokes about has kind of become more enlightened. <laughs> Some of you know what I mean. <laughs> I used to tell jokes here, and about an hour later, Kevin would hear the joke, and he would say, Peter, I'm not telling you what to do or not. I'm just wanting to tell you three people complained about that joke. So, so <clears throat> I've, I've spiritually uh, cleaned up my act with uh, some of my humor. But this is that concept that it's not an either or. It's a, it's a both. You know, the growing up and going to Catholic schools, I remember it was either or. Either there was evolution or there was creation. You know, either we came from monkeys or we fell out of the sky, you know, from God's creation, God's mind. Casey answers that question, he says, yes. Yes? What do you mean, yes? It's either or. No, he says there was an influx, the first influx was uh, ev evolved, was evolutionary. And he says, you know, basically, that's why we have a tailbone, that this original influx as they, we could project into all different beings, and we thought the ape form was pretty cool. I guess we liked having hands. You know, if, if, I guess if birds could have hands, maybe we'd be birds, but, but maybe that was hard to evolve. But we became, uh, worked with the ape form. But then Casey said there was a second influx that worked with creation. And that's why we today, you know, you have a coccyx, a tailbone, but we have chakras, we have the spiritual centers. And so we are the interface. You know, as Casey said, uh, as Jesus said, the alpha, the omega, the opposites meet in me, meaning that the spiritual and the physical meet. You know, that's why one of the symbolic representations of, of Jesus being born physically but having a spiritual father, parent, is the combination. He represents us. We're, we're half spiritual, half created, and we're half of the earth. And our lives are about what are we feeding? Are we feeding the earthly consciousness or are we feeding the spiritual consciousness? Because we have both draws. We have the draw to the, you know, one more donut, you know? <laughs> and, and then we have the draw to, oh, I should be meditating. And when I do, I feel much better. You know, that, that uh, fight is within, uh, within all of us. So what's next here? Yes, and so this, uh, dual identity that he talks about, you know, the, the I am, you know, the I am Peter, you know, the Peter is my finite self, and the I am is the infinite part of me, that I have a part of me that's going to live and die, but I also have the soul part that has always been and will always be, and I'm this overlap of the finite and the infinite. In Earth, incarnating, it's very easy to get identified with the physical body and to forget our spiritual or origins. And Casey's work is about trying to remind us of our spiritual self, try to feed that, try to have that part of us grow uh, more and more. And here's a parallel quote from Carl Jung, that the purpose of life is to move our center of identity. So when you say, I am Peter, you know, if you believe in reincarnation, I'm just now saying, I am Peter. I may have said in a past life, I am, you know, rect rectus or whatever, and I will be, I am in the future, I am Amshatrina. Maybe I'll incarnate it. I'm judging her. <laughs> so I'm going to have to have a life as Amshatrina. And so, the, but the I am is what remains. And so the purpose of life is to move that center of identity from what Casey calls the personality to the individuality, that we become more spiritually identified. And as Jesus taught, well, there's, that's where peace resides. That's where you get the peace beyond understanding. The finite is going to die. We have to face that. But the infinite will never die. And one of the main uh, teachings of Jesus was about that, which Casey tried to go uh, uh, expand upon. And so let's uh, uh, 
Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, depictions of Jesus, of the Christ. I personally feel that, uh, you know, when I was growing up, I felt a very close uh, connection to, uh, to Jesus. You know, I aspired to be more and more like him. And then around adolescence, you know, then I, then I started seeming like a farther and farther <laughs> uh, uh, hope. And then when I went to college, uh, my first course was in folklore and mythology. And we started learning about uh, creation mythology and immaculate conception mythology and then how that's part of a lot of myths. And it was a sad day that as I saw uh, Jesus recede to being like the Easter bunny or like Santa Claus, that it was just another lie told to children. And that's a sad day. That was sad to just say, oh, maybe he was just a guy. He wasn't all that. And what I later learned is that education and religious spiritual belief are inversely proportional. The more education a person receives, the less faith, the less religion, it, it kind of replaces that, I believe, with the worship of science. And I think science is just uh, not, you know, not, not, doesn't do the same things for you that I think your faith can. And I owe it to Edgar Cayce in reawakening uh, my belief in Jesus and into that story. And you know, Cayce's story is very, very deep about uh, the Christ and about his love for us as humankind always from the beginning as we came into the earth and got uh, caught up in the physical forgot our spiritual origins you know there, there's a reading where he talks about the debate going on with the souls that were not incarnate and watching what was going on and that part of the debate was let, they, they're on their own they should uh, they should face what they've created we, we are not responsible for them and the other viewpoint, which apparently was led by the soul of Jesus, is that if one soul can get lost in the earth, then any soul can get lost. And that became the movement, the second involution, to try to, re to help uh, the souls that had gotten lost back. And Casey says that's told in Jesus' story about the lost sheep. If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and loses one, which, what shepherd would not go after that one sheep, at the, you know, leave the other 99 behind to go after the one that got lost. You know who doesn't believe that story? Shepherds. <laughs> Shepherds have a hard time with that story because they, you know, Tom Baker, who was a priest, he said when he would preach that sermon, you know, they would, some of the, he would work in rural settings, some of the shepherds would say, you know, that's never made sense to me. There's no shepherd that is going to go after one sheep and risk the other 99. You know, you just you cut your losses. You lost one, you keep going. And so Jesus knew that that was a strange story, that he was talking about a different kind of father, a different kind of involvement, that we're all uh, that important. And then, you know, talks about the, the involution, you know, the five root races, all the way. You know, there was this long-term plan about trying to create the way out. And Edgar Casey was part of that plan. We're all part of that plan, just part of um, helping us uh, find our way, uh, our way back. Um, and you know, it, uh, I believe that Casey, you know, Jesus had that promise that I come that you may not just have life, but that you might have it more abundantly. And I think that we're all here, and a debt of gratitude is owed that Casey has helped us have life more abundantly you know, through the encouragement of awakening ourselves spiritually, you know, whether it's through meditation. I haven't talked about dreams. I know some of you were here at Jerry Lazarus' talk on Saturday, you know, with work with ideals. All of this is that not only will we have life, but we might have life more abundantly. You know, the, the path of the physical has its um, rewards, but ultimately, you know, it's the, it's the story of the prodigal child you know, we've all been given these tremendous gifts, and we go on this long, long voyage until we experience separation and loneliness. And Casey says, loneliness is ultimately separation from God, separation from our source. And we begin to make the way back. We make our way back with 
the, the fruit of our experience is humility. And we come back as companions with our Creator, knowing what it's like to have been separate, knowing what it's like to not be in consciousness of God's presence. And we come back with that uh, presence. And, and you know, the, the prodigal son, kill the fatted calf, send out the robe. And oftentimes we talk about the prodigal son, but they were two children, weren't there? What about the one that stayed behind? What's the consciousness of the one that stayed behind? It's like, what? You're going to do what? You're killing a fatted calf for him? Oh my God, you never threw a party for me. This is not happening. Uh, I, no, I not to tell it to the hand. No way. That's the, the story is about how we have gone on that voyage and we've made our way back and we are the companions that, that God hoped for. That, you know, who knows what it's like to be in oneness but the one that's been away from it and now can fully appreciate it. The one that's been there the whole time doesn't have that uh, consciousness of appreciation. And so Casey tells that story that all of our, our trip throughout creation, we focused on earth because that's where we are now. We've all been great saints and we've all been great sinners. All of it has taught us. We've grown because of that and we're making our way back in humility to be companions with our, uh, our source. Go ahead. Go ahead. I shortened my talk because I thought this morning would go longer. <laughs> but I can talk, believe me. Um, but uh, let me open it. Um, uh, let, I'm going to open it to questions and, and mini lectures. You know, I know this is ARE, so we'll <laughs> yes. <laughs> 